my name is Roger Cruz. I have, for my sins, been practicing for, uh, it'll be 30 years next year, colon hydrotherapy. I studied with um, uh, a very uh, wonderful doctor called Milo Seward in the UK, who alas died about three years ago. Um, and like Cathy, I'm involved with teaching as well, uh, and have been since 1992. Uh, so, uh, in my history as a colon hydrotherapist, I have been chairman of ARCH, which is the UK association, f on three occasions, and I've now been put out to grass, and I'm now what's called honorary president, uh, which means that I take very little responsibility, uh, but keep my ear close to the ground on what's happening. And ARCH would certainly wish AE. HC, a lot of success in Spain, and it's very nice to uh, be at this conference to address you on one of my pet subjects, which is the ther thermotherapeutic effect of colon hydrotherapy, which is something that I find has often been missed uh, by um, people who are trained, I, I don't want to be too uh, uh, denigrating here, but trained as technicians rather than therapists. And I think this is something that David mentioned this morning about very short training. Uh, it's got to be, uh, the, the levels have got to be improved. And as a matter of interest, in the UK at the moment, there are what are called national occupational standards being drawn up for colonic hydrotherapy, which is another step in the process of regulation. At the moment, we have what's called voluntary self-regulation in the UK, um, uh, which is proving quite successful, but unfortunately, the uptake by the public has been rather low. So uh, um, just to go back in my history, when I first started practicing, people used to telephone to make an appointment, and they'd ask good questions like, how long have you been practicing? Uh, are you experienced? Now they telephone and say, how much does it cost? Which is the wrong question. <laughs> the, totally the wrong question. Anyway, um, let me start on my presentation. The thermotherapeutic effects of colon hydrotherapy. Unfortunately, the research base in colon hydrotherapy is very small, and that is for a number of reasons, in my view. There's certainly a lack of funding, um, uh, big research projects get a lot of government money and uh, uh, other funds, whereas CAM therapies get very little funding, uh, mostly because uh, not a lot of money can be made out of them for the big corporates. We also have very much traditional and folk origins, although you know history always taught that colon hydrotherapy uh, emanated from enemas in Egypt and the Far East and South America and West Africa. Uh, it's amongst all folk traditions, the use of water rectally. Um, and as a result, at the moment, certainly in the UK, it's sold mostly on lifestyle choice. Uh, we have, uh, and I think probably the same thing exists in Spain, uh, with restrictions on advertising, what you can say on advertising. It ignores totally the traditional use, and you can only put objective, um, uh, provable uh, um, uh, claims on any advertising, so we have to say that it improves complexion and this sort of thing, which uh, may or may not be um, uh, acceptable to the public. But, but our clinical experience is excellent because we treat thousands of people. Uh, we have lots of return patients, uh, large numbers of clients, and we have a lot of support from believers, which is very, very good. So I'm just going to run through some effects of colonics that we know, we realize, we can all see. Uh, I would regard colonic hydrotherapy as a rather conservative therapy, although a lot of people don't because the idea of it, the exposure of uh, parts of their body that they're not used to exposing is uh, rather uh, distressing to them, or potentially so anyway. It's up to us to thera as therapists to put them at ease. Um, we teach it as an adjunctive therapy in the UK. So although courses aren't very long, we expect people to be already trained and already a therapist. So as a consequence, we train doctors, nurses, and what I would refer to as substantial complementary therapists. 
And simply, putting very simply what we do, we distend the rectum, and that will certainly start to uh, produce a stimulus for defecation. Uh, we know also the effects on the various neurological reflexes. Um, and this I, I do like uh, a great deal, this one, which shows parasympathetic vagal, parasympathetic sacral, and sympathetic responses. And I'll talk about those a little more uh, in a moment. But these are known neurological pathways. And of course, with these neurological reflexes, they work both ways. So if you can... If you're eating things, uh, for example, it will produce gastrocolic reflex, well known. Um, if you're also introducing water into the bowel, you're going to have a chologastric reflex. It feeds back both ways in the neurological pathways. Uh, we know also simply the effect of water temperature on muscle tone. Uh, neutral has little effect. Warm water acts as an antispasmodic, it will relax muscle, and is very useful for hypertonic bowels, the IBS-type bowels. And cool water also has a stimulating effect. So for very slow hypotonic bowels, we can cool the water down until you get a peristaltic reflex. We know the softening and hydrating effect of water. Put water into the bowel, the bowel primarily is uh, an absorptive um, uh, organ. It will reabsorb digestive juices. We produce about eight liters a day. Not all of it is reabsorbed in the bowel, but a significant amount is reabsorbed back into the bloodstream. If we put more water in, we will hydrate the feces and also cause some uh, absorption into the bloodstream. The detoxifying effect. Um, this is often argued by conventional medics as saying, oh, we're quite capable of detoxifying substances that are produced ourselves. Yes, under normal circumstances, perhaps, but when we're dealing with people who are already um, uh, carrying a, an illness burden of some sort, then they are not necessarily capable. And one thing that I find that uh, I often notice after giving a treatment is that people say, I feel light, I feel lighter. And I always regard that as a liver sign because when you are emptying the bowel of toxins and feces, you suddenly stop an absorption of uh, these uh, toxins that are produced in the bowel or potentially toxic substances that's going to the liver. So the liver has a good rest after a treatment. <coughs> oh, sorry. Uh, yes, that's right. Both locally and systemically, that is. The effects on mood, a lot has been written about this, a lot has been spoken about it uh, today. Um, uh, and there are various hypotheses around. Uh, I quite like uh, uh, this one uh, as an edit, uh, as a, uh, the effects of colonics as a uh, sedative, uh, quoting that a lack of thermal exercise uh, during um, a life uh, can lead to malfunctioning of the brain following a neurolimbic pathway uh, and uh, uh, mediated by dopamine. Again, another neurotransmitter. Uh, it also uh, uh, can have, uh, therefore, theoretically, a sedative effect. The effects on the microbiome we heard this morning. Thank you very much for the research that you have carried out. Uh, that adds to the font of our knowledge. Uh, there are a couple of other pieces um, that, that I know of. Uh, again, unfortunately, quite small trials, uh, but uh, certainly the results were found to have little effect upon the microbiome uh, in the um, uh, uh, after colonic hydrotherapy. Little effect on overall balance from a Japanese paper, and with probiotic supplementation, uh, it was found that bacteria increased after supplementation, so again, that adds to our, our knowledge. But, and this is what I would maintain, the results are often much greater after treatment uh, than we can explain easily. And this is where I think hydrotherapy, the external use of water, we can look at that because the history is much longer uh, and uh, they have a bit more research and a long experience of the use of it. Uh, like
colonic hydrotherapy, it has very much folk origins. And of course, we are 60% water anyway, so we rely very much upon water for our nutrition, uh, for our uh, overall balance. Um, giving you an extremely potted history, a very small history, um, it was first uh, documented, written about uh, in the late 1600s, uh, early uh, uh, late 17th century, by a doctor in England, but where the action was really was in Central Europe. Uh, Johann Hahn, um, in, uh, at the, again the end of the 17th century, Vincent Preissnitz, who was a great success, uh, he was a Silesian peasant, so that's now Czech Republic um, uh, from that area. He was pretty illiterate, but he practiced hydrotherapy and had a vast number of patients who he claimed to cure, although I think we would now use the word encouraged to heal themselves, using just cold water. Uh, the one probably who was best known and has had the most lasting effect is uh, Sebastian Kneipp, who was a Roman Catholic priest uh, in uh, southern Bavaria. And he practiced uh, between 1820, well, sorry, he was born in 1820, uh, but practiced uh, in the latter part of the 19th century. And he was extremely well known during that time better known than the president of the EC, uh, better known than a lot of people are now, even President Obama. He influenced a lot of people, and his legacy lasts in this respect. In the United States, John Harvey Kellogg, um, who is a quite a well-known but rather eccentric naturopath, had a, a, a sanatorium in Battle Creek, uh, used um, colonics, amongst other things. I think he used yogurt, by all accounts. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, uh, he was active really late 1800s, early 1900s. He'd been to be uh, visit Kneipp in Germany. Benedict Lust was sent as an emissary in many ways from uh, Kneipp uh, to introduce hydrotherapy into the USA. And um, uh, he also founded the Kneipp Society, which let it later became the American Naturopathic Society. And another person who you may be familiar with, Henry Lindlar, who uh, was a publisher, uh, rather an overweight publisher from America, uh, went to visit Kneipp for health problems. And he was converted there despite the fact that Kneipp, uh, this is a picture of him, is rather a grumpy fellow. And he said to Henry Lindlar when he sat down and was listening to all his troubles, he responded, you are a pig, you have got sugar disease, which, <laughs> which literally meant he was diabetic, which we see type 2 diabetes very regularly now because of the sort of diets that we follow. And uh, hydrotherapy, again, corrected his diabetes, cured him. Um, amongst some of the things that Kneipp left, he left a school in Bad Warishofen, this is the outside of it, where they teach uh, hydrotherapy um, uh, year round. He also left two sanatoria, um, and uh, which uh, have treatments, mostly hydrotherapy, but uh, it also um, uh, following his naturopathic principles, which I'll mention in a moment. There are a lot of spas in southern Germany, but particularly grouped in Bad Warishofen, which follow the Kneipp therapy. And the Latin senus par aquam uh, is, of course, the origin for spa, S-P-A, which has led to a big industry, spas in all over Europe now and further afield, obviously. I've spent um, three separate weeks over several years uh, in the Kneipp School um, with a postgraduate tutor there. There's a group of us um, uh, delving into bathwater. Um, uh, uh, and we, the last course we had was on literally on bathing and therapeutic bathing. Um, so uh, I'll come back to that in a moment. 
Knaip use, and this is very important, and this reflects to one of the questions we had earlier today about how many treatments. How many treatments? How long is a bit of string? You don't know. You can only assess how to treat someone after you've treated them the first time, after you've taken a case history. But it's got to be combined with other things that they do. And this is really important. And this is actually one of the problems is that you can treat them, which is a relatively passive um, treatment as far as they're concerned, but they should then go away and attend to their diet, to their lifestyle, and maybe take some recommended supplements or recommended herbs or whatever. And the, the different uh, therapies that Kneipp used, regulatory therapy was in the middle. And this, to him, in his day, was religion, was prayer. Today, we would be, uh, I suppose, being less religious. Uh, we would regard it as many things, possibly. Meditation, respect for nature. It's the spiritual side of the being, and we shouldn't ignore that by any means. Uh, he also used dietetics. Uh, which in Germany I always find dietetics a bit severe, a bit brutal. Um, uh, dry bread that you have to chew for 20 times and things. But I think, putting it simply, uh, lots of green vegetables, vegetables from above ground, less meat, less saturated fat, these sort of things. Uh, kinesiotherapy, movement, activity. Uh, that is something that I think is becoming increasingly important nowadays, especially amongst the younger generation who can be seen with their digital appliances um, not uh, moving very much. Hydrotherapy, of course, which we're covering, and phytotherapy, the use of herbs. So it's a combination, and this is why we teach it as an adjunctive therapy. Hydrotherapy is thermotherapy. This is how it works. If we use water because it has very peculiar, very good properties. It has a high transmission of heat, uh, but it is actually the temperature that we use. And the whole principle behind it is that we apply a thermal stimulus, which leads to a reaction, which then leads to regulation. And, and Kneipp said, quote him, it normalizes by strengthening the power of the body to heal itself. And this is very much a naturopathic point of view. Um, just harking back to the lack of research, unfortunately, one of the, the uh, problems we have with scientific research is that from a naturopathic point of view, we don't treat diseases, we treat people. And this is where scientific research has a great deal of Dif difficulty in getting to gra grips, grasping what we do. So hydrotherapy can make you feel very nice. <laughs> I'm looking particularly smug there. <laughs> uh, temperature regulation. Bear in mind we are homeotherms. Temperature regulation takes precedence over all other metabolic processes within the body. So if you are cold, you shiver, you produce heat, chemical heat. If you're hot, you perspire, you uh, 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 lose heat through evaporation. And this is governed by the hypothalamus. And we, we achieve this her thermal homeostasis by having an equilibrium between heat production and heat loss. And it is by this regulation that the, the adding the stimulus and getting the reaction that we can get what's called an alterative effect or a balancing effect. And I'll come on to what those effects are in a moment. Interestingly, in terms of hydrotherapy, there's quite a, a, a distinct table of temperatures that are used. And of course, you can use ice even, which we don't use in colonics, I uh, hasten to add. Cold, under 18 degrees Celsius, and then it moves through cool, tepid, indifferent, which is a sort of body temperature range, uh, to warm, to hot, to very hot, which we don't use. If you look on the right there, in terms of colonics, we tend to work and teach 
28 Celsius to 40 Celsius. That's the sort of range that we work. And of course, uh, the neutral temperature um, would be 37. Interestingly, um, this is just an aside in many ways, uh, if you increase the body temperature above 37.5, then the digestive system tends to close down. It won't secrete the enzymes, it won't secrete um, uh, uh, the digestive enzymes. So during a fever, the old saying, you don't feed a fever, you starve a fever. Proteins break down at above 43 degrees, or start to break down. So if you used really very hot water in the bowel, or anywhere else uh, in the body, then you would lead to a progressive cell death. But interestingly, tumor cells, it's been found, are more sensitive to uh, uh, temperature. And this is another um, uh, use of external hydrotherapy is hyperthermia and you this has been practiced for many many years and you've probably seen pictures of people in Turkish baths with ice packs on their head keep the head cool but get the temperature body temperature up the normal body temperatures obviously vary and you can see uh, the cent center of the body here you would expect to be at 37 degrees Celsius, but then the extremities are less. So, you know, your feet tend to be on the cool side. I often say to my wife that her bottom is a little cold, and you can understand why, because the circulation is less. <laughs> so how do we control this thermoregulation? Well, if you look on the chart here, we've got uh, the body temperature. We add the stimulus of hot or cold water. We disturb that steady state. That then is fed by receptors in the skin and hypothalamus uh, to, the, uh, uh, to the hypothalamus, which then goes through to the effectors, which are uh, vasoconstriction, vasodilation, which is what I'm going to come on to, uh, and will then transmit via the adrenal medulla, the thyroid, skeletal muscles, sweat glands, the pilomotor, your hairs will stand up on end, all this sort of thing, uh, to regulate your body temperature. And the reactions one can, if, can expect from this stimulus of water that you apply can be local. And of course, in colonic hydrotherapy, we're looking at a lot of local reactions to the bowel muscle. These are the first things that we notice. If you apply hot water to a spasm, and spasms in the bowel often occur in the lower bowel, the uh, sigmoid uh, descending bowel, then you find when you start a treatment you can't get much water in, but if you increase the temperature the spasm will slowly relax and then you can start to get water in and induce peristalsis, induce the mass peristalsis to empty the bowel. You can get segmental reactions via the uh, nerves and via the, uh, the cutivisceral reflexes. This is going outwards. So if you use water on the outside, you're on skin, on dermatomes, uh, you can feed into internal um, uh, organs. Through the nervous system, especially the autonomic nerves, you can con get consensual reactions. For example, if you treat one arm or one leg, you can get reaction in the other arm as well. Uh, hormonal reactions via the hypothalamus. Uh, immunological, very interesting, there's been a bit of work done with colonics on this as well as with hydrotherapy uh, to find how it affects the immune response and immune reaction, uh, which I've got some figures on. And of course, not to forget the psychological aspect of treating, which I think we're going to hear from, or hear more about later. So local reactions, we can expect to have local reactions from colonic hydrotherapy on the smooth muscle of the bowel. We can expect to get reactions from the microbiome, which we've already heard about today. And the fermentation products of the microbiome. 
some of which would be very useful. They'll be the short-chain fatty acids, acetic, butyric, propionic, valeric, uh, but they might also be the toxins as well, like skatol, indole, cresol. We will have a f an effect upon the vasculature, uh, which is going to be very important, and the blood, the circulation. And you could affect, uh, obviously affect the pH. Normally, the ascending side of the bowel is going to be somewhat alkaline, and the descending side of the bowel is going to be somewhat acid. And we're going to affect that by cleaning the bowel out, by emptying the bowel. Interestingly, um, it might sound very obvious to us, but there have been uh, some research papers done by conventional um, uh, medics, one of which, warm water irrigation for dealing with spasm during colonoscopy. Simple, inexpensive, and effective. Wow, did we know that? Yeah, of course we knew that. Um, uh, and uh, another one um, which this person down in uh, research and medical services in, in Los Angeles seems to be very keen on because they've done quite a few uh, works on colonics. Warm water infusion as an adjunct to usual air insufflation during colonoscopy. Uh, there was a Chinese paper as well uh, on the better acceptance of colonic hydrotherapy prior to colonoscopy rather than using um, uh, products to cause uh, massive evacuation, chemical products. <clears throat> the reaction one can expect follows the same rules for hydrotherapy in colonic hydrotherapy. Temperature, the temperature difference, the length of exposure, and interestingly, the time of day. Treatments done in the morning are more effective than treatments in the afternoon with hydrotherapy. But you have to be careful. And hydrotherapy, you tend to do smaller, gentler treatments in the morning and more uh, uh, stronger treatments in the afternoon. And this would also apply to colon hydrotherapy. It's to do with our circadian rhythm. Short cold applications. It's interesting that both Preissnitz and Knipe only used cold water. And everyone would go, oh, you know, in those days they must have been really hard and uh, cruel and this sort of thing. But actually, they only used cold water to generate heat. This is the thing. So although they didn't have running hot water, uh, the use of cold water is still used today, but the interesting thing is, or well, the important thing is, it should only ever be a short cold application. Short cold generates heat. So what you get is you get a primary blood vessel contraction followed by a secondary dilation, a bounce back. And this is uh, conducted via the nerves. You get a minor fall in blood temperature a reduction in heart rate, which can last up to 30 minutes after a short cold application. And you get initially a primary sedation and then a secondary stimulation of metabolism, metabolic processes within the body. It has an analgesic effect, especially with a large, um, uh, a great difference in water. So if you use very cold water, uh, it would be greater. Reduces inflammation and reduces edema. And I hope I've got the graph here to show you. This is what happens after a short cold application. You can see up to one minute. So you're talking about short cold is always going to be less than one minute, probably in the region of about 45 seconds. You can see an initial uh, decrease in circulation followed by a big bounce back in vasodilation. And you can also see that the metabolism rises uh, during, during this time. So short cold stimulates, uh, uh, stimulates uh, circulation and metabolism. If it's longer, then it will depress it. And this is why the short period of time is really important. 
So you do not want to expose the body internally or externally to a long cold application. It must always be less than one minute. Heat and overheating increases body core temperature, which is exactly what you'd expect. Uh, it can increase heart rate and cardiac output, and it mildly increases oxygen demand, metabolism, reduces pain, reduces muscle tension, obviously, and increases filtration, glomerular filtration in the kidneys, diffusion, and phagocytosis. So difference between short and long hot. Here you can see, uh, uh, thankfully, the, the, the warmer, the hotter treatments are longer. So they're a bit longer, but you can see how circulation increases and metabolism increases. And if it goes on for any length of time, then it won't, it won't maintain the circulation, uh, but the metab metabolic rate uh, continues quite highly. Now, interestingly, the most effect you get are from what are called revulsive treatments, which are hot and cold, which I'll come on to in a moment. In terms of blood, cold exposure increases, has been found to increase circulating leukocytes uh, and natural killer cells. These references are available. I'm sure they, uh, they will be uh, available on any handouts uh, or uh, the recording. Um, uh, this was, let's see, uh, another paper uh, uh, which has been found increases T lymphocytes and natural killer cells um, and interestingly has, uh, may have an effect on uh, innate tumor Im immunity, which is again something to do with this challenging of um, uh, thermoregulation. The, the addition of a stimulus, so it's uh, 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 temperature exercise, if you like. Blood values, these are the results uh, that were found uh, before and after treatment uh, with cold shower and, and uh, a hot and cold. So before you can see the levels, percentage of hemoglobin, which afterwards goes up quite significantly after cold. Uh, percentage of red blood cells, which again goes up uh, significantly after cold application, and number of white blood cells, again high. Uh, the effects on white blood cells are quite large after this uh, revulsive douche, or uh, which is a hot and cold shower. And a good recommendation for anyone uh, is to always finish your shower uh, uh, daily or whatever, with a cold application to at least the lower part of the body. If you're very brave, you can do it for the whole body, but it will increase your leukocytes, it'll increase your immunity, improve your immunity. Effects on the autonomic nerves. Uh, these can be quite marked. Uh, uh, a paper here just foot bathing, this is using warm water, mind you, warm water on the autonomic nerve and uh, immune function, found one, significant changes in me measured autonomic responses, especially an increase in parasympathetic activity, which again one would expect, and uh, 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 an accompanying decrease in sympathetic activity, and significant increase in white blood cell count and natural killer cell cytotoxicity, again backing up other research. And this certainly uh, applies the use of warm water will stimulate the parasympathetics, the use of cold water stimulate the sympathetics. So this is what happens when you use a short hot followed by a short cold. Uh, and again, you're talking about a, um, a length of time of about four to five minutes for the hot and then a short duration of cold. But you can see this has uh, a long effect after uh, after treatment is uh, discontinued. So uh, this has perhaps the largest effect, which obviously has a bearing on what we do or can do as colon hydrotherapists. So circulation, we have a, a very large effect upon circulation. It is exposure time dependent. Um, 
but you get with a short cold application you get compensatory vasodilation so you get blood going to the area afterwards long cold I wouldn't put people through that on the couch um, it will lead to vasoconstriction and lead to a cooler core temperature which is why if you're doing any treatment you should always finish at body temperature or just above 37 38 degrees Celsius neurological effects of water which can be measured this is external applied water which uh, obviously uh, applies as well internally cold water decreases nerve conduction conduction velocity uh, cold stimulates the, the sympathetics as I said warm tends to stimulate the parasympathetics and what happens is if you use the water temperature within the range sort of usual range for colonic hydrotherapy 28 to 40 um, unusual to go down as low as 28 except for very stubborn people uh, in my experience most people I treat between 37 to 40 uh, really nice warm water you get good results and you have less risk of stimulating sympathetic uh, reactions which you don't want um, but it has this alterative effect and balances the auton autonomic nerves which is another reason why people often feel really good after treatment the segmental reactions these are ones I mentioned via the, um, uh, the, the nerves you can expect um, reactions via the skin, the muscle, the gut, internal organs, even the bone. But don't forget these reflexes work both ways. Um, so by working inside the body, you're transmitting nerve impulses to the other in the opposite direction to usual to the outside. So what I would conclude and try to make this applicable to our own practice as colon hydro, colonic hydrotherapists Use warm water for nervous people who are probably a bit sympathetic driven. For IBS patients um, who have an already overactive bowel. Use neutral temperature water for normal bowel types, people who go for cleansing, who perhaps are in spas for detoxing, this sort of thing, who don't have any bowel problems. You can use cool water in graduated steps for people with really constipated, impacted bowels. Uh, you may well need to rest them. Uh, quite often you'll find during a treatment that it's not necessary to keep putting water in and emptying. More will happen when you're resting a bowel with water in than, uh, than happens during active treatment. Uh, we have a saying, less is best in terms of that. Um, uh, so for constipated bowels you can use cool water don't be afraid though to vary the water temperature during a treatment and of course machines are really good for this um, you have instant um, uh, control of temperature variation uh, using the mixer valve on them uh, in the UK I think probably most probably still a majority of people use gravity systems where it's less easy to alter the water temperature quickly but we still manage it but with machines it's much easier to do it uh, but I would say it's very very good for other related conditions bowel related conditions pelvic conditions in particular because you're working locally and whenever I think of pelvic conditions I always think of sitz baths revulsive sitz baths warm bath cold bath pelvis in very very good for things like ovarian cysts things like this same with colonics you can influence that area within the pelvis bladder problems hormonal problems and systemic systemic problems as well uh, uh, chronic fatigue syndrome I can think of various things arthritis these things associated with bowel problems really useful to work on varying those water temperatures Just a word of warning though, if you overstimulate the sympathetics, and this can happen to any therapist, if you overstimulate them, then people will go suddenly very quiet, they might go pale, they might get sweaty, they might, hairs might stand up. 
I doubt if you'll see the uh, dermographia, the blotchiness of skin and things, but the only thing to do is just to stop the water, get them to take nice deep breaths, relax, and it will pass. It always passes, and usually very quickly as well. But you, what you don't want to do is to continue to treat and continue to massage and continue to work reflexes. You have to let them uh, just relax. And in my experience, and I'm sure in yours as well, it's usually a large gas pocket on the move. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think that's about all I've got to present. I hope I've kept within your time basis, which I think I probably have. I have got time for a few questions, but interestingly, I'll just add the most common recommendation I make to people I treat over the almost 30 years, and it must be to probably half of them, and I'm sure you would agree here, is eat slowly, chew well. Because so many people eat so fast, and what you see coming out just proves it. It doesn't lie. <laughs> Are there any questions that people have? Ah, good. Sí, eh, bueno, la puntualidad británica de Roger me ha impedido presentar. Roger Cross desde Inglaterra con la ponencia. Uh, Roger Cross, and he comes from the UK, and you've already heard his presentation, but I wanted to say who he was. Now we do have time for questions. Any questions? Okay. Talking about temperature, the external and internal temperature when you do hydrotherapy. What about the environmental temperature? What about the environmental temperature? Because I have some colleagues that have the air conditioning on really, really high when they're doing the hydrotherapy. Or, for example, when women give birth, they usually turn off the air conditioning so that the process goes more swiftly. So. As you have been talking about the hypothalamus, I would like to know whether there is an impact also of this environmental temperature, ambient temperature, when you're doing a hydrotherapy. That's my question. Thank you. Right. Thank, thank you very much for that. It's a very interesting question. Uh, living in cold, damp England, we don't tend to have air conditioning there. <laughs> so we don't turn it off. But I think you have a very good point, and I think... Um, when you're treating someone with any sort of therapy of this sort, you need temperature, the temperature at, at a good um, 20 Celsius, ideally. Um, so if it's very low, if you're taking it down below that, then I think the, the, the potential uh, difference, the shock to the body is going to be too much. It should be comfortable for the patient. That's the important thing. Comfortable for the person you, that you're treating. So I think it's wrong to have it turned down to 15 or whatever. And of course, air conditioning also, it produces um, uh, not a good atmosphere, a dry atmosphere. Does that answer your question? Hello, I'm Susanne from Germany. And uh, I'm using the Colon Hydro. And uh, actually, I use temperatures about 21, 22 degrees as an intermittent and have very good success with it. So uh, I just wanted to ask you, is that y just your point of view that you don't go lower than 28 or is it in general? Um, I, I think... Uh, 28 is not an absolute minimum. I would say 40 is the absolute maximum, though, and I think that's generally recognized. Um, I know in Dubai recently they've set it at 39 for some unknown reason, but I think 40 is probably the, the maximum. You can go down much lower. Uh, I just feel that 21 is a bit um, extreme, uh, but then, of course, different cultures have different 
things. And I think in Germany you probably need more extreme temperatures. <laughs> If you'll excuse me saying that. <laughs> well, my, my, my patients actually quite love it when I drop the temperature and some ask for another run. So yeah. maybe that's cultural. Yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. Thank you, Rand. Maybe. <laughs> I have the following question. When you have been mentioning the different applications of warm and cold water, the studies that you were mentioning, the papers you mentioned, refer to intralumen water. Are they general hydrotherapy papers also applied externally and you're just extrapolating this information? I just need to have this data clear. Absolutely. I, I can uh, clarify that very easily. Is Yes, it is external application. The graphs that I showed were all external application. I'm extrapolating it for internal because it doesn't exist for internal co colonic hydrotherapy. Uh, I'm hopefully adding to an aspect to our knowledge base of what we are doing with colonic hydrotherapy. Yeah. I hope that's clear, clarified it. Hi. Um, just um, bringing up <laughs> English. Uh, um, in our clinic, we do use cooler water as well, more around the 25, 26 degrees Australia. So maybe um, we come from the hot area, so people like it to be cool. But one thing I actually notice in doing the, the temperature is that as people come to me more often, as their um, colon is cleared, they start to feel the temperature more. So when they first come, they don't actually sense what temperature is going in. And it's not until they actually start to uh, connect to their body that they actually then start to feel the differences in temperature. And I just find that interesting. And then just one other point is you talked about core temperature and not leaving people too cold in, the, in their core. And I, and I get that. And sometimes our people are cold in that core we use heat packs on their belly and I use oils and I feel that that helps that body balance because I do find that using the cooler water that I've been using now probably for the last five years since my last sort of training, um, we, we get yeah quite amazing results with inflammation and, and releases and uh, stuff I'm talking about tomorrow anyway, but yeah. Yeah, in, yeah, interesting comment, and yes, I would, I would expect that people can be more sensitive to temperature, um, uh, uh, temperatures used during treatment, uh, in subsequent treatments, because you are exercising their bowel, they're getting to know what that feeling is like, you're inducing mass peristalsis, um, uh, which is what we, we do during uh, colonic hydrotherapy, from a very basic point of view. Um, uh, you can certainly use cooler temperatures and uh, you will get these responses. My comment about using warmer temperatures is quite interesting because my, I, I had a very rural practice down in, in Cornwall in the far southwest of uh, uh, England. And the people coming to me, I found, although many of them would say, I am constipated, they were actually IBS. They were hypertonic bowels. And I only tend to use warm water with hypertonic bowels because otherwise you'll induce spasm for which they will not help uh, thank you for. But there are other areas of England where everyone coming to you is hypotonic, is constipated. And it's just got to be something societal, stress levels or something of that sort. So I tend to tailor temperature according to the people I have. And after taking a case history, what I tend to do is at least mentally determine, is this person hypertonic or hypotonic? If, they're, if I'm sure they're hypertonic, I'll start at a warm temperature. But if I'm not sure, I'll start at body temperature. And then that will tell you. You will, you will see how much water you can get into them. If you can get bucket loads into them, then you need to cool the water down. If you can get very little into them, you need to warm it up. And, and if I know they're hypotonic, and we have some people, some people I treat or have treated, uh, defecate once every six weeks, you know, it's r the really extreme people that I know I've got to use really cool water. And those are the sort of people I might use um, 21 degrees, uh, you know, the German extreme cold temperature. <laughs> Thank you. Ultima pregunta. Thank you. Congratulations for your 
very beautiful presentation. Oh, thank you. I am Arrigo Dianin from Italy, and I want to uh, ask you um, why you uh, suggest uh, the cold water for constipated patients or clients. Uh, um, uh, well, uh, uh, you say that uh, the cold water uh, stimulates uh, a sympathetic system. Right. Um, it can stimulate a sympathetic system, indeed. Um, but you need the cold water with constipated hypotonic bowels, underactive bowels, to stimulate the, peri the mass peristalsis. When that starts, you can usually take the temperature up. Uh, there is always a risk, and it's always a balance. You may stim overstimulate the sympathetics, uh, but that is part of the balance of treatment in many ways. So I would still maintain, you know, use cool water for underactive bowels, warm water for overactive ones. Um, uh, that's what I found through experience, basically. So uh, the, the consequent uh, question is, how you uh, recognize a, a hypotonic uh, uh, bowel? Ah, right. How do I recognize it? Firstly, from case history taking, my rule of thumb is if people say they're constipated but they go, it's the form of stool, it's the frequency of passing stool, IBS uh, type uh, C, the constipated type, tend to be several times every third day, something like that, rarely more than three days. If someone says they go, they defecate once every seven days or ten days, then they're hypotonic, almost certainly. They can't be IBS because it just would get too uncomfortable. Um, uh, so through case history taking, but also through um, uh, treatment. As I said, if you're unsure, if you use the wrong temperature to start with, the bowel will tell you what it is. With a hypotonic bowel, you can get a lot of water in because it's very slack musculature. With a hypertonic bowel, it will not accept the water. It just won't take the water. Um, so that's, that's the sort of the, the, the ultimate test, if you like. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good.